All right, everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Peter Buckland. I work at Penn State's Sustainability Institute. Um, and before we get going, uh, I really want to uh, recognize the hard work that Ben Mitchell puts into doing this program uh, every week. So if you wouldn't mind um, just applauding her. <laughs> So uh, in about, I guess it was in 2008, a, a good friend of mine uh, came over for dinner and said, Peter, my family's company uh, is working with farmers all across Pennsylvania so that they can uh, make money using this really great, clean, natural gas extraction technology. It's amazing. It's just like water, and some sand, and just like a little bit of chemicals. And it's like really super double safe. And I remember sitting there looking at him and going, I don't think that this could possibly be true. And a year later, was uh, we had the first uh, fracking well blowout in Pennsylvania. And I was like, that's what I'm talking about. So then he and I got to have some some really good times together uh, <laughs> after that. But it, it, was, it was my first uh, acquaintance with uh, fracking in Pennsylvania, uh, which led me on for several years to become really quite alarmed personally, and I became an, sort of an activist on the issue. And as I did and learned more, I learned about Frack Tracker. And Frack Tracker uh, became uh, something of an indispensable tool for me and, uh, and people all over the Commonwealth to understand the emerging um, and spreading impacts of fracking. Um, so a couple of years ago, at a climate change event, I met Brooke. Um, and uh, I thought, wow, here is a person who is, is committing their life and their technical work to track things that I believe could constitute human rights abuses. And so when Maddie and company were putting this together, I thought, well, we should get this person here to really talk about the interconnection between energy development um, and the potential exploitation of people and that it doesn't really have to be that way. And so here, we're going to hear from Brooke, who is the executive director for Frack Tracker and has a background at the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources and the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, to talk with us about data um, and, and the future and how we can do things differently than they are now. So without further ado, Brooke Lenker, Frack Tracker. Thank you. Okay. How's that sound, right? All right, well, I, I want to apologize. Uh, I had some quality time with uh, Route 322 this morning. But uh, anyway, you've had time to memorize our mission statement. <laughs> so, um, so I wanted to start with this slide because we find ourselves living in strange times, uh, extreme politics and extreme energy, a climate unraveling into chaos. To me, this recent headline captures the madness of our unquenchable thirst for fossil fuels. So uh, humanity's track record indicates an utter lack of prudence and occasionally complete idiocy. In 1967, the United States Atomic Energy Commission sanctioned Operation Gas Buggy, you have to love the name, right? In the Carson National Forest in New Mexico, as an experimental technique to extract natural gas from sandstone, nuclear devices were detonated 4,000 feet underground. Results were disappointing. Uh, I believe the gas was highly radioactive. After years of cleanup, the legacy of Operation Gas Buggy is an unadvertised and lonely interpretive marker at ground zero. So the title of my talk Extraction Immorality, Renewable Absolution, was accidentally converted 
to extraction immortality. <laughs> Which, and so d despite the hemorrhaging by some companies of billions of dollars a year in the race to squeeze out every last hydrocarbon, it does at times seem that the oil and gas empire is immortal. But for our sake, we better all hope they fade into a role of minimum relevance. So uh, the picture, this picture of Earth is called the Blue Marble. And it was taken on December 7, 1972, during the last Apollo mission. And it captures the immense beauty and fragility of our planet. You know, whether it is a gift from God or a perfect cosmic evolution, we innately know, or should, that it is wrong and downright foolhardy to degrade and destroy such an exquisite home. So my big idea for today isn't original, but it is vitally important. And if we accelerate our attention to it, it will be one of the boldest, smartest, most significant things civilization has ever accomplished. The idea that needs to be reheard and exercised is this. We must, press upon must, embrace and pursue a wholesale monumental shift in how we produce and consume energy as if our lives depend on it. To that point, I want to provide a relatively brief <laughs> virtual tour of the immense footprint of oil and gas development and the toll it takes upon humanity. frozen in time. So, shoot, this GIF is supposed to show you the stellar, uh, not stellar, uh, frightening, <laughs> uh, example of how drilling is taken off in Pennsylvania. So picture this map, picture on the left side, the, uh, the, the, the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania is sort of over the western third of the state and across the, the uh, northern uh, third, more or less. And uh, since about 2002, we've now drilled, uh, the industry rather, has drilled over 11,600 unconventional wells in Pennsylvania. And that the drill out has been accompanied by over 13,000 violations for well pads on the well pad or on, or on the site in general. Uh, and those violations are issued by the Pennsylvania DEP. So, uh, they're not learning, the industry's not learning from its mistakes. The mistakes re recur. And even last year alone, 795 unconventional wells were, were drilled. So I'm sorry this isn't working because it is uh, pretty um, amazing to see the transformation. Uh, as of the end of uh, 2017, to put this into perspective, Pennsylvania versus the nation, there were approximately 1.3 million active oil and gas wells in the United States, both conventional and unconventional. So wells are drilled in the middle of cities and towns, as um, this report through our mobile app demonstrates. You can see this in uh, Los Angeles. And we drill next to houses um, our research found that in 2018, nearly 860,000 uh, individuals in California lived within 2,500 feet of an active oil or gas well. In, in Pennsylvania, in a 2018 analysis, we found that over 170,000 people uh, lived within a half mile of an unconventional well in Pennsylvania, or excuse me, an active oil or gas well. And we drill under homes. This map shows the laterals uh, beneath communities uh, 
uh, near uh, Colorado's Front Range. So analysis we did found that in Colorado, there are six public schools within a thousand feet of a well. And in fact, if you want to check it out, there's an uh, interesting piece um, on uh, Late Night with Trevor Noah. Uh, it, it, you know, it's kind of uh, cheeky, but they do a story about the Bella Romero Elementary School. We've done a lot of analysis around that school, looking at the proximity to drilling to it. Um, but anyway, there were yeah, six public schools within 1,000 feet, and at 2,500 feet, uh, 39 public schools and five private schools. So we're putting uh, our children in harm's way. So why does this matter, this, this proximity issue? Well, um, because there's a growing body of research, uh, now quite voluminous, that points to impacts on human health uh, and the environment from unconventional natural gas development. A 2016 paper by Jay Kayes and Sean, uh, Seth Shonkoff of physicians, scientists, and engineers for healthy energy showed that 84% of all the health studies had a positive association with negative impacts on health, with demonstrating health risks from uh, natural gas development. And air pollutants are often considered the greatest concern um, when it comes to these health issues. These images are from West Virginia and show the visible emissions associated with the different phases of activity at a well pad during site preparation, drilling, fracturing, and completion of the well. On the Frack Tracker website, you can actually scroll over these pictures and, and it will tell you what is actually happening on the pad at that time. So imagine living next to this. 10,000 oil wells in the Kern River oil field of California. So I took this picture from, I'm not joking, it's called Panorama Park uh, in Bakersfield, where you can see the air pollution, smell it, and taste it on the back of your throat. And as a bonus, uh, while you're taking in the view, you get a dull headache um, in, and, uh, and as you enjoy this post-apocalyptic landscape. But it's what we can't see that is so alarming. This is the Trillith Compressor Station uh, near Butler, Pennsylvania. It's in Butler County. Uh, it moves natural gas along a pipeline. Everything looks pretty fine, right? A little bit of emissions at the one stack. But when you look at this through forward-looking infrared, uh, our friends at Earthworks have um, some of these cameras. And they're, uh, they have certified thermographers. They've been through extensive training. Uh, even one of our staff has been trained in this now, too. And these cameras show you up to 20 different volatile organics, including methane and including benzene. So when you look at this through that, at that this is the same scene, but looking at it through the FLIR, you can see what's coming off the emissions that are coming off that compressor station. Earthworks is doing this work in different regions of the country, and the results are alarming, to say the least. And I'm saying, darn it, this isn't working either. So I had this GIF made to show you uh, our work with Earthworks uh, at this. is called the ME platform off the California coast. Um, so we were out there with Greenpeace. Uh, in the, and I was so envious. I wanted to be on one of those Zodiacs too. But they went out, and they were checking on these offshore rigs. And this was alarming. Again, it looks pretty innocuous. But you should see what's coming off this site. So, uh, after observing these, these rigs, uh, we, uh, our, our colleague wrote up a uh, violation notice or, or uh, complaints to the regulatory agency in California, and I believe fines were issued for what was happening with the fugitive emissions off these rigs. Um, so methane is a potent greenhouse gas, you all know that, and blowouts like this one pour it into the atmosphere. This incident was at an XTO well pad, that's ExxonMobil by the way, um, in eastern Ohio, and it spewed methane for over 20 days at a rate of up to 100 million cubic feet of methane per day. This was according to uh, EPA Region 5 pollution reports. 
But other forms of accidents happen. Uh, like this 2014 Statoil weld pad fire, also in eastern Ohio. Everything on this pad was destroyed. And aquatic life was killed for, I think it was like a seven mile section of the nearby stream, as it, the whole way to the Ohio River. So accidents also happen on pipelines. Uh, and these are the pipelines, the national pipeline network that carries natural gas uh, and other hazardous liquids. Since 2010, there have been over 5,500 accidents or incidents on the U.S. pipeline network. Uh, on average, each day in the U.S., there are 1.7 accidents or incidents on these pipelines. 1.7, so almost two accidents a day. Uh, and those require per day, nine people to be evacuated, and $1.3 million in property damage. A pipeline catches fire every four days and results in an explosion every 11 days. These incidents result uh, in an injury every five days and a fatality every 26 days. So you don't need to remember those statistics. But I, um, I just want to point out too that like most of the maps on our website, if you go to this, you can, it's interactive, so you can zoom in and you can learn more about where the exact locations and nature of these incidences. So um, consider the problems and natural resources encumbered in the development of just one large pipeline. In this case, the 350-mile Mariner East 2 project across the southern third of Pennsylvania. In total, any tooth path. Put this in perspective. This one pipeline includes 1,227 stream crossings, 570 wetland crossings, uh, 11 pond crossings, and then even of those stream crossings we mentioned, 19 are exceptional value streams, uh, 318 are high quality streams. So those two sets together mean that uh, are all waters that DEP considers special protection. So Mariner East 2 uh, was plagued by spills and inadvertent returns during its construction. So this chart shows uh, the number of incidents by county in Pennsylvania and the volumes by county of those spills. So I think we had said here 90, it's actually I believe over 100 now, there's some additional data that's not reflected here. Um, of these are spills of drilling muds and drilling fluids. Uh, one of the spills was in the into the Latorte watershed, which is a, pr a prized trout fish. In fact, it's a, not just a prized trout stream, but it's a uh, probably world famous trout stream. Uh, parts of the pipeline corridor are still being plagued by sinkholes. And keep this in mind. There are more than 2.7 million miles of pipeline in the US. That's enough pipeline to span um, 11 times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Uh, and I, I remember this statistic, or this figure, from uh, DEP's Pipeline Task Force from a few years ago, where they said um, that they were, they were projecting out that in the next 20 years, Pennsylvania could see 30,000 miles of new pipeline constructed. So ecological concerns like forest loss and forest fragmentation are substantial. Penn State researchers, uh, for one, Margaret Brittingham comes to mind, um, have explored these issues. And this map of Bradford County, which is perhaps now a few years old, suggests the severity of the footprint and the fragmentation that's occurring. And it's, it's only worsened since this map was made. So forest fragmentation risks the introduction of invasive species and heightened predation and disturbance of interior nesting songbirds. Unconventional wells are expansive, usually more than five acres in size. So add to that impoundments, access roads, pipelines, lighting, truck traffic, the noise of pumps and motors, and it creates what is essentially an industrial zone. Uh, so this reality is most egregious when it's near schools, or near homes, or, in this case, on public lands, like our state forests. 
to one third of Pennsylvania's state forest landmass. Over 600,000 acres is leased or otherwise sort of eligible for drilling. If all those leases are exercised, what does it mean for the health of our forests or the, or the quality of the recreational experiences that we enjoy? You can see the kind of fragmentation that is worrisome. Uh, in this view, this is the Tyadotten State Forest, probably northwestern Lycoming County. Um, and I don't know if you can see it very well, but you can see the well pads, you can see the uh, one, a big freshwater impoundment that's probably four or five acres. You can see the road network connecting all these pads. That, that wasn't there before. That was all forest. And so now it's being cut up. Um, and this is a few years ago. But, um, oh, and I don't know if you can see the yellow dots, but there's dots on all those well pads. Those are all violations. Some of them were spilled. Uh, some of them have to do with there's the DEP inspectors found methane leakage at the wellhead. So I think almost all those pads had violations, some multiple. Um, so th I find this personally, um, I, I guess I take this personally because um, I used to work, as, as uh, Peter alluded to, I used to work for Pennsylvania DCNR. At a time when we were launching the Pennsylvania Wilds Initiative, this was a, a major ecotourism program uh, to try to sort of make Pennsylvania's uh, northern tier counties where there's a lot of public land, the Adirondacks in Pennsylvania. And the, the initiative is still happening, but I, but I have to think that extraction and the level of extraction that's occurring is so antithetical to a restorative, nature-based experience in Penn's Woods. Perhaps the most incongruence between the very industrial process of modern extraction of public land conservation and recreation values can be found where drilling is encroaching on our national parks. Um, these images are from the Little Missouri National Grasslands, which encircles both, uh, both units of Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota. Um, and you can see more of these photos and maps at uh, fracktracker. Dot, or excuse me, at npca.org backslash fracktracker. Uh, we did a project with the National Parks Conservation Association in 2014. And, um, you know, it was really alarming what we saw then. And I can only think that with the, the current administration in power and, and how they're opening up public lands, in, including attempts to open up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, that um, we're seeing what we're seeing here is just uh, sort of the tip of the iceberg. And it's only gotten a lot worse. So uh, these are also photos from 2014. And I know it's a little hard to understand what you're seeing. But you're basically uh, looking down into like a culvert or a, a, a ditch. Uh, and what should be an intermittent stream and what it should, should have been at that time dry. Because California was experiencing uh, you know, this egregious drought. But no, there was water in here. And an activist showed it, took us to this site and said, these are the frack rivers. This is one of a few of the along the coast here north of Ventura. And um, they're coming out of the mountain there where there's, um, there's oil extraction happening, but it's fenced off, we can't get there. But the belief is that the fracking has gone awry. Something, there's been some sort of blowout. And, these are, and there's a few of these. And uh, so they uh, worked with a consulting firm that did testing on this. And there was way elevated arsenic levels in this water uh, and um, surfactants. So it was evidence that it was coming from the oil fields. And uh, there's even a, you can't barely see it in the picture on the right, but there's even a child play toy. So kids could have been playing in this ditch. Uh, we watched, I actually watched when we were standing there, I watched somebody walking their dog down the beach. The dog stopped and lapped the water that was coming here. Um, so uh, I pivot, and across uh, behind me is, of course, the Pacific Ocean. And there offshore is Channel Islands National Park. And the waters are a national marine sanctuary. So of course, water is a really big deal, and we 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 hear we think a lot about the water impacts of fracking, um, and we know that water, both quality and quantity, um, is you know is this topic intertwined with these discussions. So the nature, you know, the water problems. There's a lot of studies, and you saw if you remember back to that earlier slide. 
there is a most of the studies show a positive correlation with um, with yes a, a relationship that, that fracking caused water contamination. Um, and I say fracking in the big term. I'm not necessarily just talking about the stimulation process. It could be lots of things happening, but the act of being there and drilling and, and doing all the things that's ha that are happening on those sites is is sometimes causing water contamination. So uh, Public Herald, an investigative news outfit, did just a stellar work in doing DEP file reviews over a number of years. And what they found is that in, in, the, uh, in these drawers of DEP offices, in total, there had been 9,442 complaints by homeowners in Pennsylvania saying something happened you know, to my property or to my water when they started drilling near me. And about half of those, so, so there are those I should clearly point out, they're not all water complaints, but half of those are. Well, just about half, 4,100, 4, so not quite half. Um, so 4,100 of those were complaints that, yeah, my water's turned a weird color, there's bubbling in my pond, you know, whatever. And um, so, and, and only a small fraction, maybe, maybe 300 people have gotten positive determination letters from the DEP. But we don't know how many people have signed non-disclosure agreements. We don't know how many people have had water treatment systems put in by the industry and say, but say you can't talk about this with anybody. Um, but we do know that there is a, just a striking correlation. When you look at the number of cases of these complaints per municipality and per county, it, it overlays almost perfectly with the um, highest density of drilling. So last year we analyzed frac focus data. This is a, a website where the industry generally reports each, each well job, each stimulation. And we looked at their data and found that, um, and this was consistent, that the, the industry is using more and more water each year. So now an average well in Pennsylvania, an average un unconventional well, uses 11.4 million gallons of water to stimulate. So that's the equivalent amount of water of 17 Olympic-sized swimming pools for one well. Um, we're not even going to talk today about how many truck trips it takes to get that much water in, or all the temporary pipeline you have to lay over miles to get the water there. So anyway, it's a lot of water. Um, and this is being driven, this water use in part is being driven by longer horizontal legs that are going out you know, two miles in cases, or even longer. Uh, in, in, and in some cases, deeper wells. So uh, just last weekend, uh, there was a, a, a news report about a well in Westmoreland County uh, that was being drilled into the Utica Formation. And that well was communicating, I love these terms, communicating with shallow gas wells. So those, those wells were experiencing higher pressures all of a sudden, and the, and the big well was experiencing a, a weird drop in pressure. So something was happening. But that well was drilled to 13,700 feet. Now that's, obviously it's over two miles into the earth. So it's just something to contemplate. Again, the extremes that we're talking about. And with all that water, with all that water use comes prodigious volumes of waste. Um, and and that, I think waste is really one of the sort of lost stories of, um, of uh, fracking. Like people don't realize the amount of waste so this graph was a little dated, but you can see that in 20, that red line, in 2017, Pennsylvania's unconventional wells created over 50 million barrels of produced water, aka brine. Very salty, uh, probably radioactive, um, and lots of trace other stuff in it. So 50 million barrels, a barrel is 42 gallons. So that's over 2 billion gallons of waste that was produced in Pennsylvania last year. Um, so most of that waste, or I don't know if it's actually most, I'd say a significant volume of it is going to injection wells. And a lot of those injection wells are in Ohio. And we also, though, are starting to see an uptick in the number of injection wells in Pennsylvania. Because let's face it, it's cheaper to ship it a lesser distance and uh, keep the waste at home, so to speak. Um, also, Pennsylvania waste, that last analysis, was going... Different kinds of waste, liquid and other, was going to eight different states. So as mentioned, some of this waste 
a, a chunk of it goes to Ohio, which has an extensive class two injection well network for wastewater. And of course, Ohio has a lot of unconventional wells, wells as, as well, <laughs> thousands. So their waste is also going to some of these injection wells. So in December, we did a little road trip, and we went to this particular injection well in Belmont County. And uh, we, uh, my co coworker, Dr. Ted Alf, was with me, and he had all this waste data. And he said, Brooke, this well uh, has accepted 87 million gallons of waste in the last six, in the last, uh, six years. So, and we were watching trucks pull up and uh, unload while we were there. So this waste injection, as you may know, is, really, is considered a, uh, a cause of induced seismicity, man-made earthquakes. And um, we've had, there's been some of those in Ohio, but the most egregious, keep using the word egregious, uh, the, the worst place for this is in Oklahoma and to a lesser extent Texas and, and a little bit of Kansas. And uh, so we did this analysis in 2016 and, uh, and some of the data was just astonishing. There have been uh, over 7,500 earthquakes um, since 2011 in that area. Uh, those were earthquakes greater than 2.5 magnitude. And some of those earthquakes were over 5.0 in magnitude, causing serious property damage. Um, but the, probably the, the most crazy number was this, that the EPA estimates that um, more than 2 billion gallons of wastewater are disposed of in this country, are injected, I should say, every day in this country. 2, point, 2, 2 billion gallons every day is injected underground. It's almost unconscionable. And by the way, those infographics, that story you can see on Frack Tracker if you're interested in, in learning more about even some of the volumes at specific wells, um, they're huge. So, but another front, another sort of lesser known front in this environmental degradation related to this industry uh, is sand mining. So uh, this, uh, there's been this assault unleashed on the farms, the forests, the wetlands of uh, the upper Midwest, most notably in Wisconsin, especially west central Wisconsin. So there, America's dairy land is becoming America's sandbox for the oil and gas industry. And it's really important to kind of put these things into perspective um, for, for the brutal irony. So this is, this is the uh, pretty close to the driftless region of Wisconsin. This is where ecology had its birth, this, the, uh, the science of ecology. And Aldo Leopold penned a Santa County almanac. So a little bit of data on these, on these sand mines. Uh, in 2013, we looked at the, the full extent of them and uh, the land use changes that were involved. Um, and we found that there were 75 active mines. They occupied an area of about 6,000 acres. Uh, and each of them was roughly the average size was 75 acres. We, did, we just completed a more recent analysis where we um, looked at non-metallic mineral parcel registration, which is sort of like a, a system where if I'm a farmer and I want to lease my land for sand mining, I can register it with the county and say, I want, my, I want them to go ahead and mine my, my land. I can use the bucks. So we looked at the, the fairway for those registrations. And that doesn't mean that that's where more sand mining will occur, but it could occur. So with that caveat, the data said that um, in West Central Wisconsin, the, that future fairway of sand mining could consume another 212,000 acres or 331 square miles. That's like clearing an area the size of the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area. And, and I should have said this up front, I suppose, but sand, as you know, is used in this process as a propagant. Uh, you have to love some of these terms again. But it's to prop open the cracks in the shale let the, the gas or oil flow. Um, and so now we're in this era of super laterals. They go out for, you know, as I said, more than two miles, sometimes three miles. And, um, and we found this uptick in those, the length of those. So we've also seen this uptick in profit demand. And the, and the, the volumes of sand are, 
are just uh, are just off the charts. So um, now we're talking about uh, sand usage for, per well from anywhere from 25 to 30,000 tons per well. Again, think about the transport and the energy use it takes to move product, to cor to quarry it, to move it, etc. So the, the resource demands certainly are extreme. Uh, Mind-boggling might be a better word. And one forecast we, we've worked with says that there'll be 47,600, I don't know where this number came from exactly, but it's an industry number, I believe. 47,600 new wells in the Marcellus Shale could be drilled by 2045. So what does that mean? What does that number mean in terms of resource demand? So we tried to extrapolate that. And you see some of them here, fresh water, everything else. And, and these, these numbers are mind-boggling. But the, the waste number is the one that stuck with me. Because the, the number put into layman's terms means that there would be so much waste that if you were packaging it up at one time, you could send it, it it's the equivalent volume of the average flow of the Allegheny River past Pittsburgh over 10 days. That's how much waste. The projected land disturbance, which is probably conservative from all the pipelines and well pads and everything, is about 800,000 acres, which is the combined area of the three Pennsylvania counties we've highlighted there, um, you know, like Allegheny, Monroe, um, and, or Montour, rather, and Delaware, or, and, and Philadelphia, actually four counties, excuse me. So um, meanwhile, we can't take care of the wells we have, right? The estimate of abandoned and orphaned wells in Pennsylvania uh, has a big range. Uh, DEP says it's, I believe, 200,000, but Mary Kang, who's at um, now Princeton, or at Stanford, said there could be upwards of 750,000 abandoned wells in Pennsylvania. Think about that. And we only plug a few wells a year. I mean, literally, like a handful a year. So how are we ever going to get ahead on that front, right? And the problem is that these abandoned wells can be they continue in some cases to pollute water or, or leak methane into the atmosphere or other hydrocarbons. I've smelled it out in the Allegheny National Forest. Um, and the, the bonding requirements for these modern unconventional wells are arguably extremely uh, insufficient to cover the true cost of plugging. Plus the plugs are, is, that's plugging is a inexact engineering feat. It, these plugs can fail. They often do. So, uh, so I guess the question is, you know, what, what kind of legacy are we leaving in our wake from all this activity? And how many mistakes are we going to repeat um, from the past? And I don't have time today, obviously we're way behind the schedule today, uh, to discuss the petrochemical and plastic industry plans for Pennsylvania. Apple or Appalachian or other regions of the country. Um, but just know this, an invasion is coming and it's already underway. It has the potential to make parts of our state resemble uh, the sullied, uh, toxic skies near Houston, Texas. And the signature, signature facility, not the only facility, but the signature facility of this is, the, is Royal Dutch Shell's ethane cracker in Manaka, Pennsylvania, which is bound to be one of North America's largest producers of polyethylene. And think about that. Where politicians are getting on this bandwagon to, to just build this facility and pump out the plastic at a time when our oceans are drowning in plastic. Um, and not just the oceans, but we know scientists are finding plastic in our own bodies. And the Gulf Coast is a focal point for this industry in oil and gas in general. And this map shows, and this, this map always gets me. So it shows the thousands of platforms, the thousands of wells, the more than 25,000 miles of pipeline interconnecting it all, the thousands of lease tracks in the Gulf of Mexico. And it really makes you sort of reflect. Um, what are the implications of this ceaseless quest for oil and gas? 
What does it mean for the places we treasure, the people we care about, and the planet that we call home? Okay, I'm going to say enough is enough. I'll say that. So, uh, if we don't wise up, we are corrupt, literally and figuratively. Climate change will dispense its justice broadly. And even Happy Valley will be in sodden despair from the extremes wrought by an overcharged climate. So um, Pope Francis acknowledges the immorality of it all. Believers and non-believers should, be, uh, should as well. And that's my Argentine friend, Juan Pablo Olson, with the Pope. And three of us got to stay at his Buenos Aires apartment, not the Pope's, but uh, Juan Pablo's, <laughs> in, in 2015, uh, during a week of presentations and workshops in Argentina and Uruguay, all about fracking. And, and, it, was, and it was only a week prior to our stay that Juan Pablo had an audience with the Pope at the Vatican and got this picture taken. And this snapshot in his tiny little apartment, his snapshot was just laying on the dresser. And I'm just like taken back by it. I took the picture of, of the picture, right? Um, and to me, the timing, the setting, the indirect connection to a global religious leader, it was really moving and, and humbling and, and a sign for me, you know, real or imagined. And then, then the night after that, I saw that the night after I saw that picture, I find myself presenting at the Senate of Argentina on these issues. And a couple of days later, I'm walking through the town of Paraná and hoping to lead a protest march having to do with human rights vi uh, violations against indigenous people fighting fracking in the south of their country. And even the street dogs were with us that day as we lifted, as we literally marched. Uh, passed the police car and lifted a banner up and over it. I was a little nervous, I'll admit, but, um, but again, I had one of these borderline out-of-body moments, wondering, you know, how, how did I get here in this place, you know, for this purpose? And now I admit, too, that lack of sleep and one too many glasses of Malbec may have, you know, <laughs> magnified my befuddlement a little bit. But this could be any community, in any state, or any country, uh, that are facing the angst of extraction, you know, petrochemical production, or any of the myriad related hazardous activities. But this was San Rafael, Argentina. The city is on the northern edge of really large oil and gas reserves. Fracking is underway, and so is grassroots awareness. Local leaders are mobilizing, networking, um, and they were appreciative of our insights from the U.S. and elsewhere. And I, I just find that sharing informs and inspires solidarity and action. And that's a good thing, because as citizens of the Earth, we're all in this together. Around the world, people are uniting and fighting for the right to clean air and clean water in a future that's bright and green. Across the US, people like these are standing up for their properties and their communities. So Natasha, is trying to keep fracking out of her agricultural valley in Colorado. Nileli endured asthma and nosebleeds growing up next to drilling in the Jefferson neighborhood of Los Angeles. Rebecca watched Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania uh, morph into an industrial landscape. Ellen, down here on the left, lower left, uh, was thrown in a Huntington County jail for attempts to preserve her small farm from the Marineries pipeline. These folks were Frack Tracker and our partners, um, winners for the 2018 Community Sentinel Awards. We all can and should be sentinels uh, because as our, our homes, our towns, could be the next to suffer from the next bad idea. We should all be advocates, doers, supporting renewable energy and other smart, energy efficient acts like never ever before. You know, and I, I know you all know this, but the world is really ripe for positive change. In Pennsylvania, there are so many ways to plug in for the GPU. 
Um, but, you know, there's climate reality chapters. There's the Better Path Coalition. You can champion the Green New Deal that's out on the streets these days. So get involved locally, like, like Dr. Peter Buckland, right? Like, who, who helps his township reduce its carbon footprint. Uh, if you're a homeowner, you can buy clean energy off the right from, your util from a utility. You can buy or lease solar panels and get them on your homes. You know, this is no pipe dream. According to a NOAA report from 2016, uh, their model indicated that the majority of the U.S.'s electricity needs could be met with renewable energy by 2030 without new advances in energy storage or cost increases. So what are we waiting for? Absolution? Yes. That can mean forgiveness, and there is much of that needed, I think. But it also means mercy or reprieve. And our beautiful blue planet needs that sorely. So I, I apologize, I get a little into this, a little choked up from the things I've seen over the years, but I, uh, I, I love talking to, uh, to college audiences and especially young people because uh, I think there's so much uh, potential. So. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any questions? We have time for about one more. Sure. So, hi, thank you so oh. much. Oh, you're welcome. That's a great point. Uh, no, it is, it is really depressing. I mean, and, I'm uh, thankful that you and your yeah. organization exist. I just think, oh my gosh, we live this every day. Yeah, no, it, it, is, it is really sobering. I mean, and, and, it's, and, and there's even a facet to it that's more sobering. And that is that, you know, I, I talk to people periodically. And, I mean, they break down and cry telling me their stories. And, and it's like so hard. I mean, so you, you're so empathetic, but, you know, I have the luxury of going home at night, and I don't live next to a well pad, and uh, and and so you know it's that's hard. That takes its toll too. Like you, you can you feel for them, but you can't only imagine how bad they have it. And uh, so so I guess what I can do in my role is try to share what we've learned and get and broadcast this information because these issues, as, as I think we all know, don't get enough attention um, in the media. It's, there, it's overshadowed by other stuff. But yet, this is so insidious. It's happening everywhere. These kinds of stories. So. My other question, and because I just want to make sure I tell you an experience both sure. that I had. Yeah. So a couple of Thanksgivings ago, years ago, the day after Thanksgiving, I was hiking with my brother-in-law to go hunting uh, about two and a half hours from here north above Williamsport. And I'm thinking we were in the oil shop industry. Um, well, we were, we were there, we were hiking, and all of a sudden, we hear this crack, and I'm like, it sounds like a ceiling fan, like a machine or something, and we come upon a well site, and I'm just like, whoa, I mean, like, I've read about them, and I've seen them, and but I've never been there in person, I had my dog with me dog runs up to the fence and I was just like, oh my god, like you know, my my sense of like protection, like, you know, I grab my dog like it's going to explode at any moment, which it could, but I was just thinking, if the people who who know, you know, that you've made them aware of this, but they have fully it's like, have they ever been to one of these sites in person? Like, when you actually are there, you're like, I, I felt like I was in like a movie set, like it was bizarre. It was so bizarre. Yeah, no, I, I think those are really astute observations. And it, I, I, yeah, I, I do th I agree that if you had the opportunity to take any, everyone <laughs> to these sites and, 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 and let them hear the stories of the people and what they've been through, and, and, or let them experience the forest next to a well pad, or, you know, I, I was on a site in the state forest where I could smell the smell and there's a compressor there, and it's just venting. You know, toxic emissions into our forests. Uh, 
um, you know, where you walk over the hill and in the middle of the forest there's a giant artificial impoundment with a fence around it and, and you know, um, a liner and, you know, again, it's incongruent. It is not, it shouldn't be there. And, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, there was a legacy of shallow drilling, like small, you know, uh, shallow wells, natural gas wells in our state forest system. And even when, in my earlier years at DCNR, you know, I'd see them and they weren't, um, they, they, they weren't an eyesore, and you hardly noticed them. And, and, I, and I really do think that there were people at the agency at that time when a few people started selling this bill of goods that there's this money to be made, there's this opportunity, we're getting a lot of que uh, requests from the industry to drill in the state forest again, that this would be some of the same thing. Nobody really understood what it meant to open up our forest to this kind of extraction. And um, so, I know there's a lot of, uh, you know, whatever, lament going on about what, what they allowed to happen. But, um, but yeah, this is, this is not your mom and pa old, uh, old gas well. This is a different game altogether. Are there any other questions? Um,
Shows you where everything is, and it also you can upload reports if you see something questionable. 